Good morning and welcome to Sunday School. Last week, if you remember, Corey and I did a little switch and Corey did the Sunday School lesson and I did the sermon. This week we're back in our regular places. Uh, so we will be again looking at the book of Romans and this morning we will be in the ninth chapter of Romans. So I invite you to get your Bible and turn there as we'll begin our Sunday School lesson here in just a few minutes. Uh, let me begin by leading us in a word of prayer. Lord, we come to you this morning, and we just praise you and thank you for the love that you have for us, for the opportunities we have to, to worship you and to, uh, to put our trust and faith in you. I thank you for the, the new things that we're seeing, that we're doing uh, through the Internet and being able to worship you in a, in a different way. Lord, our, our world is turned upside down. Uh, we, we see racial issues that are going on that, that don't need to be happening. And, and Lord, I just pray that, um, that you will take care of those. Uh, Lord, I, I, I pray for this, uh, this virus situation and the people who are sick and people who've lost loved ones. And, and Lord, I just put it all in your hands and just ask you to take care of it. Lord, this morning as we study your word and as we, we look at Romans, Give us wisdom, open up our minds and our hearts, let us apply the truths that we find here today, and, and let us reach out and touch people's lives wherever we are. We'll just give you all the praise and glory. These things I pray in your name. Amen. Well, again, as I, as I mentioned, uh, Corey and I are back in our regular places today. And two weeks ago, we finished up a section of the book of Romans, which is, which is chapters 5 through 8, talking very much about, uh, about Christian growth and what it takes and what I need to know in order to grow as a Christian and what it takes for me to grow. And, and two weeks ago, we finished up that very great eighth chapter of, of Romans. And what it comes down to when I'm talking about my growth and my Christian life, what I really have to know is kind of the bottom line here, uh, is that uh, I am a child of God, that God loves me, and that nothing, nothing can ever change that. Nothing can get in between me and God's love. Nothing can alter that in any way. And because God wins in the end, I win. Now, as we begin this new section of chapters 9, 10, and 11, we, we kind of return to a recurring theme that Paul has. Um, one that he's already dealt with in chapter 4 to some extent, um, but, uh, but it's, it's something that, that kind of plagues Paul all the way through his ministry, uh, and rightly so, um, and it is the, the relationship between the Jewish religion and Christianity. It's this whole idea of, of God's chosen people and who are they, and um, and how does all that fit together? Um, in the Roman church, they probably had more uh, Jewish Christians than, than most of the churches Paul works with. Because if you recall, Paul did not start that church. Uh, that church basically was started from Jewish people who had gone to Pentecost, gone to Jerusalem, and then come back on the day of Pentecost uh, and, and had become Christians then when Peter preached. And so the, the original people were Jews. And if you recall in history, um, much of the problems that went on politically in Rome, uh, a lot of that had to do with the, the struggle or the fight between the Jews who uh, wanted to be Jews and the, the Christians. And, um, and there were things going on in that situation politically. And so, uh, so this is a struggle that the the Roman church is, is very much interested in. I suspect there were even people who um, claimed Paul to be something like a traitor, having, uh, having abandoned his own people, the Jews, and had gone to other peoples. Um, and so there, there were all kinds of things that took place uh, in Paul's ministry. You remember people were, the, the discussion was, do you have to be a Jew first before you can become a Christian? Do you have to follow all the Old Testament laws? Uh, how does all that fit together? And that's kind of the section that we're, we're uh, coming into here with chapter 9. 
So let me read the first five verses of chapter 9, and we'll go from there. Paul says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption as sons. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. Now the first question that I have is, how does Paul feel about the Jews? How does he feel about those people? You remember Paul as a young man was, was well trained in the Jewish religion and had become a Pharisee of Pharisees. Um, how does he feel? Well, he would be willing to give up his own life. He would be willing to give up his own salvation um, if he could uh, affect the Jews, if he could, uh, could have them accept Jesus as the Messiah. And yet, that doesn't happen. And, and you wonder, when you think about all the things that God did for the Jews, how could they possibly miss out? Uh, what Paul mentions here, the first thing is, God chose them to be his children. He adopted them as sons. Uh, he took care of them as his children. Uh, they had the experience of God's presence like no other people ever had. Uh, God was with them, and, and they saw God's power, and they saw God's glory, um, they had that opportunity. Um, they had God's instructions. They had God's word. Uh, they had uh, his, his law. Uh, they knew what God wanted and how God wanted them to act. They had that. They had the, the proper worship of God. God had instilled his, his own uh, ideas of worship in the temple and how he wanted that done. Uh, nobody else had that. They had God's promises of, of what he was going to do and that he was going to bring the Messiah and how he was going to set up his kingdom here on the world. They had, uh, had the history and the godly leaders. They had the patriarchs and, uh, and all that that brought about. And, uh, and not only that, but God had brought the Messiah, Jesus, through the lineage of the Jews all the way down and, and, and he had brought them to. How could they possibly have missed out. And yet, they did. Let's go into verse 6. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descendants from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything, good or bad, in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I have hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For, uh, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort but on God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. So did God mess up? Did God make a mistake when he picked the Jews since, since he gave them all those blessings? And yet they missed it. And the fact is, no. God didn't mess up. 
In fact, from the very beginning of Abraham's lineage, from the very beginning of God's chosen people, not everyone who was physically a son of Abraham was actually a part of God's chosen people. You have both Ishmael and you have Isaac. And of course, the, the lineage comes through Isaac, not Ishmael. In fact, when you, when you read after Sarah's death, Abraham married again and had six more sons. Those sons weren't part of God's chosen people, even though they were descendants of Abraham. And you know what? Not only was it Isaac and Ishmael, but when you get on down to, to Isaac's children, you have the two sons, Jacob and Esau. And, and you notice what God says here. It, it's not about anything that Jacob does or Esau does. It's not about their works because even before they were even born, um, God said the older will serve the younger. So it's not about works. It's about God choosing. And, and it's about what he did. In fact, he says that it's not, it doesn't depend on man's desire or man's effort, but on God's mercy. Now, what's he talking about that doesn't depend on that? Well, that's being saved. That's being God's child. That's being part of the chosen people. It's never been about genetics. It's always been about being spiritual children of God not physical children of Abraham or of, of uh, Jacob. That isn't the issue. And so people might say, well, is it fair? Is it fair for God to choose one person to choose Jacob over Esau? Is that fair? I mean, is, is God being unjust when he does this? So let me go on to verse 19. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who resists his will? But who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? And then I'm going to skip on down to verse 25. It says, as he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who's not my loved one. So the question becomes, if it's God that does it all, and it's God who chooses, and God who elects, then how can I be blamed because I'm a sinner? Because didn't God make me the way I am? Isn't that the issue? And what Paul basically says here is that, number one, God is not unfair. He's fair. And God has the right, because he's God, to choose. Now, we want to blame God all the time for uh, making me the way I am. You know, we want to say, God, why didn't you make me like someone else? Why did you... Um, why did you do this to me? You know, why don't I have that instead of, instead of what I have? We try to blame God for those things. And, uh, and we don't have the right to do that. God is the one who has the right to decide how we are made. Um, you know, I, I even think of, um, of choices. We will make choices that get us into trouble. And then we want to blame God. Well, God, that's just the way you made me. Well, not really. Uh, God made me to have certain feelings and certain emotions, and then choices that I make are choices that I make, not his fault at all. God is God. He's in charge. I can't tell him what to do, and he is not unfair by making those choices. And then I want to well, skip on down. We want to get on down to, the, to really what I consider to be the meat of this whole issue. If we get on down to verse 30 and read the, to the end of the chapter, it says, What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. 
But Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, has not attained it. Why not? I'm going to stop right there just a minute because that's the question. Why not? Why didn't Israel, why didn't the Jews attain salvation? Because that's what we're talking about, is becoming a, a child of God, being that chosen people, because the Jews claim to be chosen people. So why not? Well, um, and, he, and he mentions this, the Gentiles pursued of righteousness and attained it by faith. But Israel pursued a law of righteousness and did not attain it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written. See, I lay a stone uh, in Zion, a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So, who are God's chosen people? Well, God's chosen people are the spiritual children of Abraham, not the physical children of Abraham. And how do you become a spiritual child of Abraham? Well, you become that because God chose you, God elected you, but also because of your faith in Jesus. You see, when, when uh, we got to that part in verse 32 where he says, why not? The answer was not because God didn't choose you. The answer was not because God chose you to go to hell instead of someone else. That is not what it says. The answer is because they pursued it by works. They tried to be good enough. Gentiles received Jesus by faith in order for, for Jews to receive Jesus and be God's chosen people. They have to do it by faith. But the Jews tried to earn it. You know, it is, it is something that is within all people. We want, uh, you know, it, it wasn't the, the stumbling block that we have here. It wasn't just the person of Jesus. Um, uh, the Jewish leaders were perfectly willing to listen to what Jesus had to say. Um, uh, there were, were some of them that, uh, that even liked some of the things that he said. They certainly enjoyed the, the miracles that he did. The stumbling block is giving up myself and accepting the sacrifice that Jesus made for me as my only way to get to heaven. You see, what I want to be able to do, what most people want to be able to do, is we want to be able to say, yeah, Jesus is great, but I want to help. You know, I, I want him to choose me because I'm good enough. I want to be good. It's, it, it is, when you look back in history, it is what has gotten the Jews in trouble over and over and over through history. It's because the Jews came to the, um, to the idea that we are God's chosen people, therefore we are better than you. And people don't like it when you say we are better than you. In fact, if you look at the situation in World War II with Hitler, why was Hitler so against the Jews? Because the Jews were saying God was on their side and they were better. And guess what? Hitler was saying, no, no, I'm part of the Aryan race and the Aryan race is better. So Hitler was wanting to say the same thing the Jews were wanting to say and they were both wrong. Because it isn't about me being better. It's where all prejudice comes from. It's where all racial issues come from, is this idea that I want to be able to say that because I'm white, I'm better than someone else, or because I am uh, 
Hispanic, I'm better than someone else, or because I am German, I'm better than someone else, or because I am Chinese, I'm better than someone else. It's where all of that comes from. It's from this idea that I want to be better. We have this idea. You, we've heard people say things like, you know, I'm as good as that preacher down the road. God loves him and wants to take him to heaven. He ought to take me to heaven because I'm as good as he is. Well, the truth is, yeah, you probably are as good as he is, but it has nothing to do with good. It has nothing to do with being good. It has to do with faith in Jesus because Jesus died to pay for my sins. Jesus made that sacrifice. You see, religion says I can earn it. I can be better than you. But Christianity says I'm not good. I'm never good enough. I have to give up myself, my life. I have to give it completely to Jesus. So how does election fit into that? Well, you see, God chooses me because I choose him. But I choose him because God chooses me. And so God, knowing everything, knows who he's going to choose, and yet I still have the free will to choose by faith to allow his life to pay for mine. So, cho the, God's chosen people are Christians, whether they are Jews, whether they are black or white or whatever. God's chosen people are the Christians. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much that you chose me, that you gave me the opportunity to accept you by faith. Lord, I ask that you will Help me to share your love to those around me. Because, Lord, I don't deserve your love. They don't either. But, Lord, it isn't about what I deserve. It's about what you want to do for us. Help us to share that message with everyone that we meet. Help us in this time as we do things differently. Help us to be um, your light of love all in our society. Help us to do your will, and we'll give you the praise. These things I pray in your name. Amen.